Well, hello to everyone from around the world. Glad that you have joined us for today's webinar. The title is Data Axel Genie, How to Generate Leads in 2021. Welcome, glad that you have joined us. We're gonna go right ahead and get started. That's a picture of me, by the way. And I am president of a consulting firm that does sales training, sales coaching and consulting. Uh, been doing that for about 13 years. And uh, I have worked uh, with uh, Data Axel Genie for the last couple of years doing webinars for subscribers uh, of Data Axel Genie. And of course, that product is super easy to use. It is an online platform that gives you the power to leverage business and consumer data to find new prospects and, of course, earn new customers. The platform has been the go-to sales leads tool for professionals, managers, business owners, marketers, and of course, enterprises for more than 15 years. We appreciate Data Axel Genie for being our sponsor today. So we're going to get started with a very lovely photograph. On the screen before you, you see a picture of colorful tulips in a sidewalk planter along a busy downtown street. And why do I show you a picture of colorful tulips? Because tulips are an image of spring. And we are in the beginning of spring in the Northern Hemisphere, but we're also at the beginning of a figurative or metaphorical spring, if you will. I think it's probably safe to say that as a people, we have been to hell and back over the last year. Uh, things have been pretty difficult, but so many things are getting better. We are at the precipice of moving from pandemic to recovery, which means that we are in an economic springtime, if you will, that will be full of opportunity. It will be a chance for sales professionals and anyone who is in charge of sales operations to really make hay because the sun will be shining brightly for the foreseeable future. At least that's my perspective. And you may be wondering, why am I so optimistic? Why are we in this metaphorical figurative spring? Well, there are about five reasons that, uh, that I could put together. And the first one is pent up demand. So many businesses have been dormant or kind of operating at less than ideal paces over the past year. Now, sure, there are other businesses that have done just fine and have been quite normal during the pandemic. Still other businesses have even done better because of the pandemic. But there are many industries that have been suppressed because of the pandemic and the related shutdown. A perfect example would be the travel industry. And, and as an example, um, to show you how things are turning around, um, I did a fair amount of traveling with my wife and kids during the pandemic because the deals were so amazing. Um, we took, uh, gosh, probably a fall break trip, a Martin Luther King Jr. Day trip, a President's Day weekend trip, partly because I had some airline credits that I had used, partly uh, because everything was so cheap. And there was always plenty of availability. Well, just last week, I had to travel to Salt Lake City for business, and uh, I didn't make a rental car reservation. I didn't attempt to make a rental car reservation until the end, uh, the day before. And um, when I did that, there were no rental cars to be had at the Salt Lake City Airport. I ended up using a different form of transportation. But I think that's a sign that things are going to explode with all of the pent up demand that's out there. Another reason for optimism is underlying economic strength of the US economy and frankly, many other economies uh, as well. And uh, if you think back before the pandemic, the economy was pretty strong. You know, the stock market was good. Unemployment was really low. Corporate earnings were looking really great. I know I was working with a lot of companies that were having the, the financial time of their lives. And like we said, many companies continued to perform well throughout the course of the pandemic. And um, and then now, if you look right now, like the stock market in recent days has hit record heights and the economy is pretty good right now, especially all things considered. My third reason for optimism right now is rapid economic recovery. And look at it this way. Last spring, our economy, the world economy, pretty much fell off a cliff. And uh, when you fall off a cliff and you have 
uh, a rare historic drop in economic activity, any partial recovery is actually going to represent unusually fast and unusually large economic growth. So even a little bit of recovery this year is going to be probably about as much economic growth as we've had in about 40 years. And so I think that is another reason for optimism. The next thing is the tsunami of stimulus dollars. Now, politically and philosophically, you may have some problems with it. And certainly there are concerns about what all of this stimulus money will mean for long-term public debt uh, and possibly inflation. But in the short run, there is going to be this drunken, lust-filled economic bonanza of, uh, of activity because you've got all sorts of money going into consumers' pockets. What happens when money goes into consumers' pockets when it's found money? Well, they save a little, they pay down a little debt, and they spend a little, which means that that money is going to end up into the pockets, accounts, and coffers of the people and organizations to which you sell products and services. So I like to think that during this tsunami of stimulus activity, we may pay a price for it down the road, so you damned well better get your share of it now. And your share means your personal share in terms of income or commission. And it also means your organizational corporate share in terms of more sales, more revenue. It's going to be an exciting time. You want to get your piece of it. And then finally, the fifth bullet point is something that's really exciting. And that's progress against this damned virus. Uh, we are making a lot of progress. Look at uh, this next slide here. This is from the New York Times this morning, coronavirus in the US latest map and case count. Uh, 14 day average, cases down 7%, deaths thankfully down 40%, hospitalizations down 15%. And you can see how things have dropped from their, their high back in January after uh, that surge we had in the late fall in the beginning of the winter. That's a reason for optimism. So is this. Great vaccination progress. I'm based in the US, so I just used US numbers as an example. But as of this morning, 25% of the United States population, or nearly 84 million people, have received at least one dose of vaccine. And 13% have been fully vaccinated, which represents more than 43 million people. And you can look at this with a glass half full or a glass half empty perspective. The half empty person says, damn it, only 13% of Americans are fully vaccinated. Oh my goodness, that means that 87% aren't fully vaccinated. But the glass half full guy, which, spoiler alert, that's kind of what I am, the glass half full person says, that 13% represents probably the most important 13% of the population to be immunized. Who are those 13%? Well, they're primarily elderly people, people with serious conditions, comorbidities, um, healthcare providers, so as to protect the integrity of our healthcare organizations and their ability to deliver services, first responders, and a lot of jurisdictions, teachers, um, and uh, so-called essential workers that keep the basic wheels of commerce that provide the essentials of life going. In other words, it's the most important 13% that could have possibly gotten that vaccination. All of this together, in my opinion, is a very good sign for businesses, for business leaders, and for people who sell for a living. Shoot, it's probably a good sign for pretty much everyone. But this webinar is for people who sell for a living. And I believe that because of the aforementioned reasons, just about every business owner, every business decision maker is more likely to make purchasing decisions now than they were several months ago. And I know from looking at the attendee lists that we have all of the time, more than half of you are in business-to-business -business sales. And those of you who are in B2C sales, most of you are probably selling expensive or long sales cycle items to consumers. And so you're in a B2C model that kind of feels like a B2B model in a lot of ways. So in other words, the people on this program today, for the most part, sell things that require a significant investment uh, and a significant decision-making process. Good news 
in figurative spring, people are more likely to do that. In fact, I like to say that basically, given all of these things we've talked about, and with all of the juicing and goosing that has happened to the economy, we are kind of in, to put it crassly, a cash grab situation. People are grabbing cash. And if you are a sales professional, you want to do everything that is ethically and legally possible to grab your share of the cash. And if you are an entity, a leader, owner of a company or a head of a sales department, you want your department, your company or your entity to grab its share of the cash, whatever is ethically and legally necessary to do that. These are unprecedented opportunity filled times. Like I've said earlier, we've been to hell and back. You might as well take advantage of uh, this good time for however long it lasts. So if we're gonna do that, I believe that selling professionals need to be optimistic, assertive, and proactive. Well, I guess you could probably say they always need to be optimistic, assertive, and proactive. But in this rare artificially juiced cash grab environment, you probably need to be more optimistic, assertive, and proactive. And you might be asking the question to yourself then, how do you do that? What's the best way to show that you are an optimistic, assertive, and proactive person? Well, it is to make a commitment to prospecting. Now is the time, if it wasn't already, now is the time to go out and win new business. Of course, as a sales consultant, I would tell you it's always time to win new business. I pushed companies to keep prospecting at full speed and full effort throughout the entire course of the pandemic. And I believe that those companies that did probably are far better positioned than those that didn't, whatever. Now, especially, it is extremely important to be a very optimistic, assertive, and proactive prospector. So when we talk about getting new business, finding new leads, generating new revenue sources as we transition from pandemic to recovery, the bulk of this short presentation, this webinar today is going to be focused on the P word, prospecting. Prospecting is pretty much my favorite word in the sales profession because the single most significant factor that separates the top 20% from the bottom 80%, the top 10 from the bottom 90, the elite from the also-rans, the most significant factor that separates successful people from everyone else in selling and sales professions is prospecting. Prospecting is key. Prospecting is king. Sometimes I'll get a phone call from a sales manager or owner of a company, and they'll say, Jeff, we need to talk to you. We need you to, to work with our people because we're lousy at closing deals. Our conversion rate is not what it should be. We're just not uh, bringing things home. We're not crossing the finish line as often as we need to. Well, that's a pretty significant concern, and I wouldn't blame someone for being upset if they weren't crossing the finish line quickly enough or often enough, but I start asking questions whenever I hear that, and the vast majority of times, if I ask enough questions and get enough intel out of the person who called me, I find out that they don't have a closing problem. They don't have a crossing the finish line problem. In most cases, they have a prospecting problem. Almost every sales disappointment or deficiency can be traced back to something at the prospecting stage. Not all of them, but most of them, almost all of them. I like to say that prospecting is perpetual. Prospecting is a way of life. Prospecting is an obsession that top producers have. If you are truly committed to being an outstanding sales professional who brings home impressive, desirable commissions, you have prospecting for breakfast, you eat prospecting for lunch, and you dine on prospecting for dinner. And when you go to sleep, what do you dream about? You know. At any rate, prospecting is like brushing your teeth. You would never think of taking a day off, right? If you took a day off from brushing your teeth, you would probably walk around like this because you would be so ashamed of yourself. Well, if you take a day off from prospecting, maybe you ought to be equally ashamed of yourself. So first of all, before we go any further, what exactly is prospecting? Because it's a word that's used by sales professionals all the time. And so a while back, I set out to define it as quickly and clearly and distinctly as I possibly could. And I came up with this. 
Prospecting is the art of interrupting someone's day when they don't expect to hear from you in order to provide them with something they need that they might not yet know. Prospecting is the art of interrupting someone's day when they don't expect to hear from you in order to provide them with something they need that they might not yet know. Complicated little definition, if you think about it, because the first part is onerous and intimidating. We do not like interrupting someone's day, especially if that person does not expect to hear from us, especially if that person doesn't recognize our name or is not familiar with our company product or offering, right? That's intimidating. And that triggers that natural inclination that we have to avoid rejection at all costs. We don't like being rejected. We don't like being shunned. We don't like being made to feel like we're idiots or we're pests because it's just part of our DNA. We want to be liked. We want to get along. We want to be a part of the group. And rejection feels painful to many people, even in a professional setting. I teach sales and consult sales. I've been doing something sales-ish my whole entire life. And I still sometimes find myself hesitating to do something because of fear of rejection. It's only natural. But then when you look at the second part of that definition, it gets a little brighter and more sunny, doesn't it, right? Because you're doing it in order to provide someone with something they need that they just don't know about yet. So prospecting is both good and bad. Prospecting is both fun and uh, not so fun, depending on one's perspective. But we know it's important. We know it's essential. And we know that in most cases, nobody ever buys something that makes their life better if it's not for some salesperson who prospects them in the first place. There are a lot of people out there who are missing out on something that would make them happier, richer, healthier, whatever, better, but they just don't know about it because they've yet to speak to some person who sells that type of offering, that type of solution. Now, here's something that's going to make you feel pretty good about prospecting, I believe, and that is the purpose of it. Prospecting has one specific purpose. Prospecting has one job, and that job is to get you a live interactive meeting with a decision maker, a live interactive meeting with a prospective buyer. That's all we want. And I think a lot of times people start to put too much on the prospecting uh, platter. They put too many expectations upon prospecting. It's almost as if you start to believe, I've got to pick up this phone and I got to hope and pray that some human answers and I've got to convince her to go all the way to the close and somehow do a deal um, really fast before she gets bored with me and uh, hangs up the phone uh, right on my ear. Well, thank God that's not what we have to do. All we have to do is just get a live interactive meeting. Once we have that conversation, and it can be spontaneous, sure, right? When you call someone or it could be scheduled, it can be in person or it can be virtual. It doesn't really matter. All you need is the opportunity to have give and take a chance to ask probing questions. When you have the chance to have a meeting, uh, whether it's impromptu or scheduled, the person on the other uh, side of the meeting, the prospective client is implicitly giving you permission to ask them probing questions, to do a discovery, to do a qualification process, to then customize a pitch or a proposal based on what it is that they truly value. And that's a glorious, wonderful thing. So that's all we're trying to get. Um, so we're in prospecting mode until we get the meeting. Once we're in the meeting, then we're in pipeline advancement mode, which is similar, but different. I'm nothing if not honest. Um, I'll never uh, mislead you or lie or sugarcoat anything. I do have some news which is disturbing for some people to hear. And that is, it is harder to prospect now than it used to be. One of the reasons for that is that salespeople commonly have to make between eight and 12 attempts to actually get a live interactive conversation with a decision maker at a prospective client company. If you are selling high value relationship, long sales cycle consumer items, it's about the same number, if maybe a little bit less. 
But let's say you're in B2B sales. If you're in B2B sales, it's taking between eight to 10 communication reach outs, attempts, if you will, to get a decision maker at that company to actually engage in live interactive conversation with you. And when some people hear that, they think, oh my God, I, I can't call someone eight times. I can't email someone eight times. I'm gonna be the biggest pest on the face of the planet. I get it. No one wants to be a pest. But guess what? Guess how many times it takes for the average sales professional to give up and not call a prospect anymore? 2.5. It takes between 8 to 10. Average sales guy gets gives up after 2.5. Is it any wonder that people say things like, prospecting's a waste of time. I hate it. No one ever answers the phone. Cold calling's dead. It makes no sense to prospect. There's no one out there. No one wants to talk to you. No one wants to talk to me. I get why people have those feelings. But what we need to do is to make sure that every single one of those attempts is a quality message, a quality communication attempt in which we practice appropriate logistics and tactics, and we craft compelling messages that we believe are appropriate for the person who is receiving that message. A couple other comments, though, about prospecting being a little bit harder than it used to be before we press on. Another one of the reasons why it's more challenging is that everyone is busier than they used to be. Part of that is because companies have cut back. We've had all of this artificial intelligence and technological advancement, which, which has made more production possible. If more production is possible, we all kind of want it. So just because it's possible, we actually work harder to achieve things that we otherwise wouldn't have been able to achieve, which has actually made us far busier than we were 10 years ago. Our parents were 20 or 30 years ago, and certainly our grandparents were a couple generations ago. The other thing is that uh, people are bombarded with communication stimuli. One of the reasons why it's taking eight to 10 attempts for a cold decision maker to actually engage in live interactive conversation with us is because that decision maker is bombarded bombarded with way too many messages, way too many phone calls, way too many social media stimuli. And so it's a little bit difficult and sometimes takes some time and persistence to cut through the clutter, to cut through all the noise, if you will, and actually get noticed so that you can have that live interactive meeting. So we're going to go through a few pieces of advice kind of tactically, logistically, if you will, that I believe are essential to successful prospecting in this world in which we live and this world full of opportunity, but yet a world still filled with some challenges and some trepidation. I mean, after all, we still are technically um, in a public health crisis. And after all, we still have a long ways to go before the economy reaches the level it was uh, prior to one year ago. So my first piece of tactical logistical advice for you is to always plan your week at the beginning. This is critically important because we're all so busy. And once your week gets started, all of a sudden the fire alarm is going off and the fires are starting and the crises need to be solved and the emergencies need to be tended to. And if that's not bad enough, then you have the shiny object, look, there's a squirrel sort of stuff happening. Your coworker asks you to go to lunch. One of your favorite vendors wants to take you to lunch or something to thank you for your business. Your family has certain needs of you during the week, and sometimes those needs uh, interfere with your work week. What I know is that if I sit down on a Sunday night and I plan who I'm going to talk to, what I'm going to say to them that week. If it's a new person, I do my uh, pre-call prospecting research on Sunday nights. Now, if I'm busy on Sunday night, if I'm traveling, which I do often, or I am maybe doing a family thing, well, then I do it really early on Monday morning. I just don't want it to happen after I get to the office on Monday. If I get to the office on Monday, that's when it's like push the go button and all hell breaks loose and life is full of chaos. So I strongly recommend you plan your week at the beginning. As you're doing that, as you're figuring out, okay, who am I going to talk to and what am I going to say to them this week? I recommend you divide your prospects, your phone calls, your emails, your communication outreaches, if you will, into four buckets. 
And you see those four pretty colored buckets right there before you. The, lefter, the leftmost bucket, the orange bucket, is your new cold prospects bucket. These are cold prospects that you will be attempting to communicate with for the first time. Now, these are people you are going to want to do some pre-call prospect research on. So if I'm going to call some impressive person or some uh, influential person or someone who would be a desirable client for me, I better know something about him or her. I better know or have at least a good idea what he or she values, what makes them tick, what problems they might be facing. When I do that pre-call research, I'm going to be looking at their LinkedIn profile. I might stalk their Facebook page. I'm going to look at their company website. I'm going to Google their name to see if they've been quoted in the media uh, or they they host a podcast or have written anything. All of that can give me a little bit of insight so I know what compelling messages to lead with when I reach out to them, hoping that I stand out uh, among the clutter, among the sea of other sales professionals that are competing for that person's time and attention. So that's my orange bucket. Those are my new cold prospects. Bucket number two. These are people who I've attempted to uh, talk to before. In other words, I've left voicemails for them. I've emailed them. Perhaps I've interfaced with them on social media, but I haven't actually had a conversation. I'm still in that cadence of eight to 12 prospecting messages that it takes in order to spur and spark a live interactive conversation. So those people, I generally based on what category of perspective that client they are. I kind of have a set cadence of various communications I use with those people. And so I'm basically gonna do the next communication attempt. Then we go into the right side of your screen. And on the right side of the midpoint here, starting with the yellow bucket, things are a little bit different. In fact, you could say that once we get to the yellow bucket, you really aren't prospecting as much as you are pipeline managing. The yellow bucket comprises or is comprised of people you have talked to, you have had live interactive conversation with, but you have not closed a deal or the deal or the current deal. With these people, you're focused on moving them down the next step. Like for instance, maybe you had a great discovery and qualification meeting with them. And next you are supposed to put together a proposal and present that to them. Or maybe you did a proposal and you gave your demo and pitch along with the proposal. And now you need to move them off of the dime and go after or beyond proposal closer to the close. Whatever the case is, you're going to have those people who you're going to want to contact each week. I would say this bucket requires some pre-call research as well, because you're going to want to look back at the proposal. You're going to want to look at the notes that you put into your CRM immediately upon completing the conversation that you had with them to make sure that you cover the next steps or to see what holes there are um, on, uh, on, on things that you have to do next. And then you have your final bucket. This is your smallest bucket. I know it looks the same size on your screen, but this is always your small or usually your smallest bucket of the week. And this is that group of people you periodically call to learn something, to probe or to investigate, to gather intel, to figure out little insider information or rumors or to solicit referrals. Lots of different people could be in this bucket, but I do know that if you're a comprehensive a full-blown committed sales professional, you're not only prospecting. You also have to be a detective who is sometimes out gathering important evidence necessary to continue to enjoy sales success. All right. So we plan our week at the beginning. We do our pre-call prospect research. We segment and strategize uh, who we're going to be contacting, where they are in our communications cadence, and what our messaging is going to be. Another tactical thing that is perhaps as important as anything I've mentioned so far is time blocking. The most successful sales professionals take chunks of their calendar, blocks of their calendar, and non-negotiably reserve it for prospecting before the week even begins. Again, if the week starts, you're chasing shiny objects and squirrels and the week gets behind you and suddenly it's Friday at 3.30 and you've not prospected a damn single 
prospect. Uh, we want to make sure we put chunks of time that are non-negotiably reserved onto our calendar before the week begins. So if you have a time block for prospecting and your spouse, significant other, boss, best friend, publishers, clearinghouse, anyone calls you during that time, do you take the call? Hell no, because that is prospecting time block and we need to have prospecting discipline during that period of time. Now, let's say you're going to uh, use your time block for telephone calling. And by the way, I believe that telephone calling still remains the single most effective form of prospecting when you consider the time, the money invested for the return delivered. I still, now I like email prospecting. I actually do more email prospecting than I do telephone prospecting. I like social media prospecting. I do a decent amount of that. I do text message prospecting. I, sh I show up at events back when we used to have events. Um, and so I do all sorts of stuff, but I still believe that telephone prospecting all things considered for most sales professionals, still the biggest bang for your buck. So let's say for the sake of argument, you agree. When should you do a telephone time block? Well, the single best time, the single best time for most people, certainly if you're in B2B sales, 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. That's when you have the easiest time reaching decision makers. One thing to keep in mind, the more senior the decision maker is in a company and the older that person is personally, the more likely they are to be there nice and early. And um, the gatekeeper, admin, receptionist, whatever you want to call that person, typically isn't there. Uh, a lot of times meetings for that decision maker don't start until like eight or nine o'clock in the morning. And so uh, there's also this belief that when one is at their desk in the early hours, maybe they're a little more open-minded than they might be when the chaos of the day has started and they're dealing with their direct reports and they're going to this meeting and that worthless meeting and getting upset because of something they heard in another meeting and they've got vendors calling them and they've got fires to put out and everything else. What's the second best time of day for a time block? Four to 6 p.m four to 6 p.m. For the same reasons, really, I mentioned above. What's the third best time of day for a time block? Noon, lunch hour. What are the two single worst times of day for a typical salesperson to schedule a time block and do uh, their uh, prospecting? 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Now, what do you suppose are the two most common times of day that most salespeople prospect? 10 and 2. So most people are prospecting at the absolute worst possible time, okay? Hey, one thing to keep in mind, let's say you leave a bunch of messages in the morning. If you are leaving messages for a decision maker at a company, there is a very good chance that that person will call you after 4 p.m. because they're packed and busy during the day. And I don't know why, but a decent percentage of senior decision makers, if they call back a salesperson like you and me won't leave a voicemail. If you don't answer, it's like the call never happened. They just go on. Um, I don't, most of them won't call you back, right? That's because it takes eight to 10 attempts. But if they do, uh, the highest likelihood callback time is after 4 p.m. And there's a decent chance compared to other professionals that your more senior people won't leave you a voicemail. So these are a few thoughts about, you know, blocking our time and, and making sure that we're organized and, and how we do things. Um, I know that if you don't take a deliberate approach to prospecting, it's not likely to work out for you very well. We're now going to shift a little bit into some basic overviews of messaging. And if I had a dollar for every time I heard a sales professional call a prospect and say something like this, I'd have an awful lot of dollars. Uh, hey, Susan, uh, this is Jeff from XYZ Company. I haven't heard from you. I'm just calling to check in, uh, touch base with you a little bit, see if you've had a chance to review that proposal. Uh, we're ready to move forward on our end. We're just waiting for the green light from you. Uh, so give me a call. Look forward to hearing from you. My phone number is da 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 da, -da. If I had a dollar for every one of those I've heard, lots of dollars. Never, ever from this point forward, use the phrase checking in or touching base when you call a prospect. Um, 
those are words that we want to expunge from our vocabulary. Because when we call to touch base or check in with someone, we're actually being very selfish because that provides no value to the prospect, the client that we are calling. It's something that we want to happen for our own convenience. In other words, I'm anxious and uh, uh, frustrated that I haven't closed a deal with you. So I'm calling to waste your time to check in and offer you nothing just so I can see if I'm any uh, closer to getting a, uh, a check uh, so which I can go buy something fun with or whatever, or pay my bills with. So we wanna expunge touching base and checking in. If you wanna remember, remember it this way. Nobody wants you to touch their base because that's rather personal and offensive. The other thing we want to do, and if I had a dollar for every one of these that I've heard, is to stop leaving voicemails like this, emails like this, or saying stuff like this if somebody answers the phone. This is a prospecting voicemail that I received once in the past. I changed the names of the person and the company to protect the guilty. But here we go. I'm going to read it to you. You can see it in front of you. Hey, this is Zachary from Lucidity. I'm not sure if Lucidity rings a bell, but I sent you over an email. A lot of other companies have been sharing with me that with most of the work being done online and remote by employees, they're focusing on having the right tools and programs to help their employees be more successful. If you have some time, I'd love to run you through a demo of Lucidity and to see if it might create some value for you guys as well. Anyways, you can give me a call back or even better, just reply to my email that I sent over and we'll find some time that works. Really looking forward to hearing from you. Blech. That's hideous. That's a hideous, disgusting, terrible, awful uh, prospecting message. Because first of all, this first sentence provides no value. It's not compelling. It's not about me, the recipient. It's about lucidity. And then we have stuff about other companies have been sharing with this guy, Zach, whatever. Uh, none of this really appeals to the would-be client who gets it. And sometimes people will do a bad prospecting message, but it'll sound a little bit nicer. Maybe like this one here. Some people will say, you should leave a message like this. Hey, I'm just calling to check in with you and see if you're okay. I'm thinking of you and wanted to see how you're doing with all the uncertainty at the beginning of this year. I know it's difficult to make decisions. So just know that we're here. We're here for you when you need our services. You know, then you give them your phone number and you go away. Boy, that sure seems nice. And I've literally heard people who are in my profession, the sales consulting and helping profession say, you should say stuff like this to your client. I could not disagree more. This is nice, but it's missing something important. And that important thing is a reason to call, a reason to call in the first place. Nobody, this phone message right here, while nice, is just as big of a waste of time as Zachary from Lucidity's message. None of these provide anyone with any sort of new knowledge, any sort of value or compelling, thought-provoking content that makes me want to talk to you. If we're going to call someone, we have to have a reason to call. And reasons to call are things that people care about, things that are people that make people interested, stuff like the economy and its effects on business, how government actions or business incentives or all the stimulus stuff could possibly affect companies and their industries. Industry insider information, rumors, behind the scenes, knowledge, trends, happenings, that stuff will catch someone's attention. If you have information about a legitimate threat that it could be coming down the pike. I'm all ears. If you have unforeseen or unanticipated opportunities that I'm not even aware of or haven't thought of, I want to talk to you. If you've got information about my competitors, now you're intriguing me. People want trustful, truthful, accurate information that is compelling, surprising, and applicable, customized to them. That's what you want to lead with when you do a prospecting message instead of, my name is Jeff, and I come from this and that company, and we offer a full range of services in the XYZ industry, and we've been in business since 1948. Nobody cares. And I'm giving you here a couple of sample voicemails, a couple of sample voicemails that you could leave if you were so inclined that would be effective in getting people to call you back. Here's the first one. This would be one that you would send to someone that maybe you've talked to in the past. Hey, John, I was thinking of you and wanted to see how you're holding up at the beginning of another crazy year. 
we talked about your supply chain concerns before the pandemic. Well, now we're seeing those concerns actually become reality. I've talked to many manufacturers like you who've come up with some pretty creative solutions. I don't know whether these ideas will apply to your operation, but give me a call so I can at least tell you what I learned talking to these other companies. Why do I like this one so much? It's because I'm not pushing features and benefits and product knowledge, right? I'm not doing a whole bunch of product ID dropping on you. I am calling John and sharing something with him. I want to give him some sort of knowledge. Now, does John know that if he calls me and gets this knowledge that I'm probably going to ask him some questions, which I hope eventually lead to some uh, feedback, which will help me make a pitch to him? Sure he does. No one's stupid if they're able to buy the stuff that you're selling. But do I have a far greater likelihood that he will call me back uh, based on this message than if I left the typical one that was all about me, my features and benefits? Absolutely. Still no guarantees, right? But I have a much higher likelihood that he'll call me back. What about this one? Hi, Susan. This is Jeff from XY Office Supplies. I found that office managers like you hate three things about copiers, one-sided lease agreements, complicated machines, and unresponsive repair techs. There's actually a membership program specifically built from an office manager's point of view, and it alleviates multiple headaches. I'd be happy to share what this means to you. Give me a call, phone number, thank you. Now think about this. If Susan is the office manager of a company, she probably gets calls from someone who works at office supply uh, businesses all the time. And Susan has probably become quite desensitized and numb to such calls. And most of those calls are probably like, we've got this line of copiers and our copier does this and it does that and even gives you a back rub and ties your shoes, right? People get tired of hearing all that sort of stuff. This one tried to relate to Susan based on where she's coming from. How does Jeff from XY Office Supplies know what things that office managers hate about copiers? Well, because he's working in the business and he talks to an awful lot of office managers at companies. And so he just knows this sort of stuff. You know that sort of stuff in your industry. And that's the type of communication we want to use when we reach out to people. And it is especially important that we do that in this time in which we're transitioning from pandemic to recovery. We must always prospect with a purpose. Sure, we wanna build relationships. Relationships are very important in sales. Developing trust is particularly important now that we've been to Helen back in the last year as a society, an economy, and a culture. But we must always have a reason, some piece of compelling value that we can share with. When you share value, people are more likely to give you permission to pitch them. But if you start to pitch them, people will shut you out. So start with value, then you get permission to pitch, either explicitly or implicitly. But when you start with a pitch, they just turn you off and really don't hear much of anything you have to say. And they can't wait to not be around you anymore. Your prospects are not interested in you, your product, your services, your company, how great you are, how long you've been in business, whether you have fancy credentials after your name or the fact that your offering is so unique, the only one like it in the entire marketplace. They don't care about any of that stuff. They care about themselves, their businesses, their lives, their profit, their employees, their families, their threats to their continued solvency in business. Them, them, them. They're, they're, they're. They, they, they. That's what they care about. Not you, 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 not me, me, me. And we have to always remember that when we craft our messages to always be client-centric and value-laden. Now, we're going to take a quick little break before we wrap this thing up. And the first thing I have for you is pretty cool good news. Um, Data Axel Genie is going to randomly choose one person who attended this webinar to receive a $50 Amazon gift card. So keep your eyes uh, glued to your email over the next couple of days, and maybe you might be the person that wins that $50 Amazon gift card courtesy of Data Axel Genie. I tell you this, no matter whether you are the gift card winner or not, they appreciate your business. And I would like you to know that I personally use Data Axel Genie in my work, and I find it very effective and very useful as I generate leads and develop lists of people that I'll target with my prospecting efforts. Here's a little information about me, uh, sales trainer, speaker. You can see there's a long list of topics that I cover, 
and I can be contacted through my website, jeffbeals.com, and um, do everything from coaching, training, uh, consulting, anything that's uh, basically involved in helping a company become more successful. But as we close up here today, uh, just a couple of reminders. About four years ago, I read a report uh, that was produced by the sales department of University Business College. And the report uh, claimed with evidence to back it up that 50% of sales leads at the typical American company fall through the cracks. They're never really properly dealt with. And in some cases, they're never even touched. 50% of sales leads fall through the cracks. And I remember when I heard that thinking, no, that's not true. There's no way it's that high. And I can guarantee you it's not that high in my company. But I can also guarantee you that it's not 100% at my company. And I would bet a lot of money it's not 100% at your company either. And so I do think that we have to be careful as we are transitioning from pandemic to recovery, that we don't take anyone for granted and we don't miss the opportunities that are right under our nose, so to speak, in our own backyard, so to speak. So keep in mind that many, many sales leads fall through the crack. What can you do about it? Well, a lot of it, frankly, is just mentality. A lot of it is a mental, emotional commitment to not allowing sales leads to fall through the crack. I like to say that we treat each prospective client, each lead, like an instant win scratch off lottery ticket. I don't play the lottery. I don't gamble, right? I'm good enough at math to know that uh, um, the odds are stocked against me. And uh, even on those games of skill like poker and blackjack, I stink at them. So I know I'm not going to gamble. I, I, I lose money when I gamble. I'm mathematically, I'm not that mathematically challenged. But despite the fact that I don't participate really in gambling or play the lottery, my, uh, my dear Aunt Mickey, um, to this day, always gives me a birthday gift. I'm going to be 52 years old next month. And I can count on Aunt Mickey, my beloved Aunt Mickey, to give me a birthday gift. You know what the birthday gift is going to be? 20 instant win scratch off lottery tickets. Oh, why does she do that? It's kind of cute. But I'll tell you what, even though I'm not like really into like lottery and I wouldn't buy a lottery ticket, the first thing I do when I open up that gift is to scratch those things off. And sometimes you win a tiny little bit, right? But you never know. You never know. Why wouldn't you at least scratch them off? Somebody else paid for them. They're laying there right in front of you. They've been given to you like a gift. Well, in your business, that sometimes happens, or maybe you're also responsible for marketing. Maybe you own the business. Maybe you are the one who's actually paying for all those leads, right? And so we know that every lead we get is at least worth a look. Now, is every prospect worth pursuing? No. There are some prospects who are not worth your time, and that's why maybe you have another person in your company who sells smaller deals, or maybe you have an arrangement with another firm where you refer business, or maybe you've got a junior salesperson that you're mentoring, and he or she can do those types of customers. I don't know. Maybe there's some people that after you qualify them, you think, gosh, best wishes to you. Good luck, but we're not the company for you. But at first, we at least want to give everyone a look-see uh, to make sure we're not having any of those fall through the cracks. Because in this day and age, um, we want to really get our share of this wild and crazy Old West cash grab that's going to be going on in our world. And to do that, we don't want to take uh, anyone for granted until we know for sure that there's someone who's not right for us. That's what I have prepared for you today. Um, my contact information is right here, jeffbeals.com. I can be reached at that phone number below. On behalf of Data Axel Genie, I want to thank you for participating in our program. And I wish you the best of success in all of your selling as well as your personal endeavors. Uh, we are officially adjourned. <music>